Hello and welcome to a CGTN special, China's Agenda, where we look at this year's two sessions gathering and examine what it means for China and for the rest of the world. This year's emphasis has been very much on continued economic growth, especially through innovation, or as Premier Li Chang put it in his speech, new quality productive forces. Striving to modernize the industrial system and developing new quality productive forces at a faster pace. We should give full reign to the leading role of innovation. Spur industrial innovation by making innovations in science and technology and press ahead with the new industrialization so as to raise total factor productivity. Joining me now to discuss the two sessions and China's plans for new quality productive forces are David Mahon, founder and executive chairman of Mahon China Investment, Marcella Musa Bellu, executive director at the Albanian Institute for Globalization Studies, and Bert Hoffman, former China director of the World Bank and now professor of the East Asia Institute at the University of Singapore. Welcome to the program, all of you. Now, David, I'd like to, to start with you, and let's zone in on this interesting um, phrase, new quality productive forces. It does seem that the emphasis there is on tech innovation, on upgrading industries, which is kind of a, a long-term perspective, isn't it, rather than a short-term quick fix? Well, that's true, uh, although it's already evident that the Chinese government has focused on technology um, upgrading of many ordinary industries, but also this tremendous development in high tech. And this is because they don't expect the engine of the economy that the property sector has constituted to return to be the same as it was before the bubble collapsed. Um, it's a very important innovation. We see it in clients we have in the robotic sector. Um, Chinese ports are at the moment involved in a tremendous upgrade. So this is real. Also, credit to private companies in the tech sector has loosened considerably. So it won't replace what property has been, but it will play a major role. And I think it's going to be a significant component of trying to reach this 5% GDP growth. Bert, is, is that how you read it as well, these um, new quality productive forces? So, look, the, the way I interpret it, uh, of course, there is the new... Um, um, already the modernizing industrial system that was on the books for a while as a priority. This year's addition is the new quality productive forces. And the way I interpret it is really uh, what Xi Jinping has been talking about, the more innovation-driven, the more productivity-driven growth, uh, but now translated into quite concrete measures in terms of research and development, in terms of translating research findings into industry. And the government has set up a whole system for that, and, and the party has set up a special committee for that to drive that new quality productive forces uh, in the years to come. So more innovation and more productivity change. And Marcella, of course, all of this is, is really important. It matters to China, but that's going to have an impact on, on the rest of the world as well. I mean, how do you see messages like this coming from the two sessions um, affecting the rest of the world? Obviously, for the rest of us, it's all very compelling. And I want to cite a phrase that I was reading this morning circulating in the, in the Chinese media about the phrase you just mentioned leveraging scientific and technological innovation to turbo change economic productivity. So this is basically what the, uh, the phrase it means. And this is also something that for the rest of us, for our sluggish economy, especially for small nation, is something that we are looking forward to. And why not some spillovers from that the same? So upgrading industry for some is upgrade, for some others is economic survival. So it's more than welcome. So new energy cars, hydrogen power, new materials, and innovative drugs. These are all being earmarked as growth engines of the future. But you know what, But these are small sectors, aren't they? I mean, do you think this is a shift away from, from manufacturing and infrastructure building that the urbanization drive needs? I mean, I'm wondering, what impact do you think it's all really going to have on the Chinese economy? Well, look, you make a good point. I think I think this 
strive to the to the future industries, if you want, and the, the new productive forces, is going to be very good for for China's development. And I think it will push China to up the value chain, as as the, as as they call it. So so it will be good for GDP, but at the same time. Uh, one needs to wonder, well, where do ordinary people get their jobs from? Uh, to give you one example, electric vehicles, it's a fantastic success story for China. Controversial abroad, but a very good success for, story for China. There's as many people working in the automobile manufacturing as there was 10 years ago. So in terms of employment, it doesn't do an awful lot in terms of, because modern manufacturing, frankly, is very automated, it's very roboticized. And, and doesn't create a job. So more needs to be done, uh, not just the supply side, but also thinking about the services sector, which has been uh, basically delivering all the job growth since 2010. And, and so the attention to the manufacturing is good, but I said more needs to be done. And for that, you also need more domestic demand. And we can talk about that role for the domestic demand side uh, in the overall development of China's economy. David, I wonder if you agree then that to, to get people to consume more, to get um, people working more, um, it's going to take other things to work alongside the, these um, um, new quality productive forces. Well, that's true, although consumption is the product of something. It's not actually a, an ends, it's not an isolated or an ends in itself in some ways. It's, mm. it's the product of innovation. It's the product of um, productivity. And I think that's where China needs to be focusing. And this policy attempts to do that. But I agree with Bert that in many ways, we don't see anything that's going to make a big impact on employment. And we also don't see something that's going to increase consumption, which at the moment is low because Chinese people are being cautious. Some are, some are anxious, but many are just waiting for prices to bottom out, particularly in the property sector. So China has a problem that consumption and the service sector have not been significant enough as growth drivers of GDP. This is even an issue before the COVID years. So there are, there's more things to do. And in some ways, some of these policies echo the, um, heavy, the industrial thinking and almost some of the command economic thinking of the past, where you drive growth through these immediate um, avenues which are very familiar to a state such as China. And the economy is modernized and sophisticated. So they need to do a lot this year to become aware of that and be more nuanced in how they um, create stimulus in the economy and allow natural demand to return. And Bert, another way of, of creating that sti stimulus has been attracting foreign direct investment. And there's been a, quite a lot of talk about that. How do you see it playing out? Well, look, uh, the foreign direct investment numbers of last year from the balance of payment didn't look so good. And that was because, largely because of the macroeconomic policies abroad. It didn't have as much to do with China's investment climate. But at the same time, you see a downturn also in the utilized foreign direct investment. Uh, companies are moving a little bit sideways. They need to see how they fit into this new environment into these new productive, new quality productive forces where they can give a contribution and frankly uh, make money. Uh, added to that is some, some geopolitical risk that now has to be taken into account. So it's, it's not a great time for foreign investment anywhere, but especially in China. Uh, of course, that, that gives demand, but the, the other side of the uh, external uh, sector is really the demand side from abroad. And, and that's where I think China uh, runs a risk. So China has been great in moving resources from the uh, property sector to manufacturing. And that means they produce a lot, but domestic demand is still not as strong as you'd want it to be. So the surpluses are increasing, particularly in manufacturing and particularly in a, in a few sectors, such as electric vehicles. And there's increasing resistance from abroad to that, if you want, this 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 big wave of, of electric vehicles and other manufacturing is coming from China. Uh, and, and that's a risk that, that could translate into protectionist measures in Europe and in the United States. And we've heard already some policy pronouncement to that extent. So, so Marcelo, I'd like to bring you in on this and, and, and how, how attractive China is making itself to, to foreign di direct investment, how it's going to be able to um, entice more foreign companies and indeed states to, to, to pump more, more money in. 
First of all, the key word that I was listening since the start of these two sessions regarding economy and investment is confidence. So the more the most the, the more the confidence is boosted, the more uh, we hear success stories, and the more we see impetuses from central and local government to these foreign companies. Of course, the more then this confidence will grow. And uh, on the other hand, we cannot uh, not mention the geopolitical uh, situation in which we are living in. So it's a question of uh, chicken or egg. So are investments uh, basically hindering politics or is politics hindering investments or are they cooperating together? Sometimes it seems that there is a big different section compartmentalized uh, for, for China. So uh, we can do business as usual, but when it comes to politics, it's something else. And then uh, the situation could get uh, could, uh, could even escalate. So first we we have to find common grounds and then boost the confidence of foreign investments. So David Marcelo, they're talking about confidence um, being quite key there. In terms of what you've been hearing um, so far from the two sessions, do you think there is a, a new determination <sighs> to reinvigorate China's economy? I think definitely there is a an intense focus by a government that I don't believe is actually sure what to do ultimately. And that's understandable. It's an immensely complex situation. And it's one that is, has been exacerbated by the isolation of the COVID years and these fiscal imbalances, which China has got away with not dealing with because of growth in the past, are now very much in front of it, um, such as the financing of um, local um, government um, projects, um, just the, the, the fees to run administrations of counties, of cities. All this has come to a rather difficult point for the Chinese government. But this is a government with tools at its disposal, which are unusual in the world. It's got very high interest rates, which it could lower. There are many things it could do in loosening up um, some of the residence requirements, the, the hukou restrictions to allow people to move more freely. And also it could open parts of its property sector to foreign investment if it wanted to clear some of that stock and to bring in, um, just to bring in investment money. So while there are major problems in front of the government, they have a toolkit that is larger and more various than nearly any other major economy in the world. So I think that they will be practical and I think they will make a number of changes the main point is, though, that the people regain a greater confidence. And we deal in remote areas of China with many agricultural projects. And while you get a lot of information from the major cities in China, people out in the counties of Yunnan, of Sichuan, people in the mountains of Gansu, um, they're just working. People are not waiting or thinking in a very analytical sense. They're dealing with local issues and they're trying to achieve, in terms of the officials, local um, objectives, economic objectives. So there is a grassroots momentum, which I think is not being taken into account enough. And this, as it always has, will continue to lift the economy. And if we're lucky, the government will adjust with appropriate policies. But it's that grassroots force that counts the most. Marcelo, I can see you nodding along there. Do you yeah. agree that it's this grassroots um, force that should have more of an emphasis? Absolutely. And uh, the, the point is that what we see outside of China is quite different. At, or what is narrated outside of China is quite different at what's actually uh, happening in China. So uh, for regarding, again, confidence, I believe uh, seeing is believing. So. For the ones that have a shaken confidence, I would encourage to go and see, as Professor Mahon said, see the grassroots uh, work which is happening now. Uh, nobody is stopping. On the contrary, they are on different gears. So that is uh, that is my, the main point. Well, while all of that's going on, of course, we've got the facts and figures to, to dig into. So, so but let, let's let's look at the, the, the work report. You know, Premier Li Chang noted it's not easy for us to realise these targets. So, China's 2024 economic growth target of around five percent is unchanged from last year. I mean, what, what is it going to take to sustain that stable growth? 
So, I mean, many have called it a, an ambitious target. Uh, the reason is that so the expectations in, in the market, but also of the IMF, were a bit lower. So uh, IMF published the data at 4.6% as a forecast. Now, they always take what they think should happen into account in their forecast and not necessarily what will actually happen. Of course, the 5% has been discussed uh, before. I believe, and in part, it is a tactical thing to announce a relatively ambitious a growth goal so that people that you turn around people's expectations because expectations has been an issue and it's been recognized by the government so becoming a bit more optimistic is one but second if i look at the data and if i look at the fiscal deficit that's the same as last year if i look at the monetary policy it's the same as last year it is monetary expansion in line with nominal gdp and a three percent deficit so you really have to go into detail to see well what what is actually happening because there's top-ups on the fiscal policy that are not clear from the initial presentation, but that do add up to maybe another percent uh, and maybe a little bit more of stimulus. I think the overall deficit, if you take everything into account, is probably a percentage point of GDP more than last year. So that gives a bit of an, an additional boost. The monetary policy, even though it is prudent, uh, the government has uh, designed a number of targeted measures where targeted credits to those priority to those priority industries can be channeled through banks and that may give a bit of an additional boost. I believe though that more more can be done and probably should be done. And as the international community looks on that the message seems to be um, David that China's door remains open to the world and its door will not shut. I mean, what, what signals might allay concerns about the economy and, and policy direction, you know, from the property crisis to youth job shortages to, to debt issues? I think the signals, whatever happens in China, we are dealing in a very strange era. I mean, I've been living in Beijing for 40 years. I've never seen such distortions in the mainstream Western media. The sort of things that um, the directors of the boards of companies of our clients read, and it's immensely negative. Um, it's almost as if economic data is juggled to create some propaganda in the Western sense that we've always judged China for doing. So these are very difficult times and you get the interpretation of demographic shifts. You mentioned youth unemployment. None of these things in themselves are crises. They're all things that in various ways we have seen in previous years. And they're ways that can, they're, they're issues that can be dealt with. Um, the youth unemployment is a common thing globally. You get a, a generation that has been brought up in a, a middle class family, perhaps for the first time. Um, they've never really had to struggle that hard. They have a good qualification, but not in something that gets them immediate employment. And they're not inclined to move to find a job. Um, they're in a family where they can stay where they were born, sitting in a suburb of Shanghai. And, and a portion of this unemployment issue is actually that. But there are things which um, the world looks on in terms of China and judges it, and they do not reflect on their own economies. I mean, globally, there is very low consumption. We're enjoying whatever we have enjoyed since COVID ended in the major economies because of tremendous stimulus and quantitative easing. And then we got inflation, and now we're facing high interest rates. Um, China went through the global financial crisis. It overstimulated. And it's learned from that. So it's been very cautious now. And as Bert said, with a debt to GDP ratio for the government of just over 20%, there are tremendous means for them to do more. But I think they're being prudent in not doing more and waiting for the market forces to drive this economy forward. If it doesn't, by the summer or autumn, I'm sure they will apply more measures. But I think there's some interesting examples here of having learned from the past. So overall, I think the trend is OK, and I think we may see some things we've been waiting for for a long time, and that's a more sensible credit policy and much more focus on the private sector. So I'm quite optimistic they'll get a real 5% this year. We'll pause there for a moment, but still to come on this special programme, China's Agenda, a force for peace will examine China's role in ending conflict around the world. It is such a dynamic innovation environment 
in China at the moment. And we want to tap into that. And in terms of our production investments, there we will follow the market. I think we're very well positioned together with our joint venture partner. Trade had been such an important engine of growth for many decades, helped lift you know, billions of people out of poverty, improve living standards. You know, we need to get back to a world where trade is an engine of growth instead of a world where we're talking about fragmentation. Uh, you know, the IMF, we've estimated that in an extreme scenario, trade fragmentation could wipe out 7% of global GDP. China can be enormously helpful to the EU. I'm thinking, for instance, uh, about uh, China dominance in production of uh, solar panels. And those can make the EU transition to uh, renewables uh, easier and, and cheaper. So it is very important to look for new ways to bring about uh, that growth. Uh, technological innovation, uh, new scientific discoveries are all very much part of that. Uh, artificial intelligence is in many ways uh, at the heart of you know the new type of uh, industries and the new type of technologies that we'll see in years to come. Um, China has a bit of a comparative advantage in that regard. One area where we see considerable growth is tourism. The number of Chinese tourists visiting Sri Lanka has grown quite significantly in the last few months. And this is a good sign, which shows that Chinese tourists are confident, Chinese travelers are confident about Sri Lanka. Welcome back to this special program, China's Agenda, where we examine what the outcome of the current two sessions really means for China and the rest of the world. We've talked about the economic message, especially those new quality productive forces. But what about China's role on the global stage? Here's what Foreign Minister Wang Yi had to say. China believes in an equal and orderly multipolar world and the universally beneficial and inclusive economic globalization. An equal multipolar world means equal rights, opportunities and rules for every nation. Certain or few powers should not monopolize international affairs, and countries should not be categorized according to their so-called strength. It is impermissible that those with the bigger fist have the final say. And it is definitely unacceptable that certain countries must be at the table while others can only be on the menu. So what does our panel make of that? Still with me are David Mahon, founder and executive chairman of Mahon China Investment, Marcella Moussa Bellu, executive director at the Albanian Institute for Globalization Studies, and Bert Hoffman, former China director of the World Bank and now professor of the East Asia Institute at the University of Singapore. Marcella, Wang Yi also emphasized China being that force for peace. How do you see that playing out? Uh, absolutely. The answer to that depends on which side of the world one resides. So being in Europe, uh, we have to admit that since the start of the conflict in Ukraine, nothing is the same, nothing is the same in terms of economics, of politics, of narrative, uh, of perception, but also sometimes uh, in shaping the narrative of, of the times, there is perhaps some kind of paranoia, so we have to take everything into account. Uh, China's, course, China's position on the uh, conflict in Ukraine has has been consistent since day one, has been uh, helping, has been out, out, uh, outreaching to other nations to find a solution. And at the end of the day, many times it has also been misinterpreted, but we have to face, we have to face that at least there is someone that is actually, there is one nation that is actually doing and providing and speaking up for uh, the resolution of this conflict. Now, David Wangi also, of course, discussed um, relations with the United States, saying um, it was obsessed with suppressing China. Now, I know that politics and, and economics can't really be untangled. What impact do, do you see, though, that China's relations with the United States having going forward? It's very bad, and I don't see it improving. Um, America has denied it, denied it was an empire for 170 years or so, when it was. Um, now it denies that it can try to contain China when it is. I mean, the tariffs and the embargoes, the 
um, the so-called security measures that have been initiated in Washington on a whole range of especially um, technology items and products um, for China are really the kind of measures you bring about when you're at war with somebody. The only thing that's not happening is the shooting. I'm not someone who believes that Taiwan is a flashpoint, and I don't think China is seeking any form of conflict. But America, in a sense, is. It's a receding empire, and it is very, very concerned about the growing economic power of China. And China had to form the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank to, in a sense, have a voice in the global forum, because China doesn't get positions commensurate with its scale as an economy and as a, a power in the world now. I mean, in most major forums, it is the very small percentage of European and Western nations that still dominate them and try to keep them for themselves, or in America's place, dismantle them. So you've got to start including China and partnering again with China, but doing it from another position, not one of condescension towards a developing country, but one of respect for what China has become. And whether it's Brussels, whether it's um, Washington or Canberra, um, at the moment, the West is incapable of that. I'm not, not optimistic about the geopolitical um, uh, tensions easing soon. This is not a great situation. It's very difficult for China. Bert, what, what do you think? Well, I'm definitely not the geopolitical expert in this, but on the last point uh, that David alluded to, I am a former staff member of the World Bank, and I've been arguing for a very long time that China should have uh, at least 14, 15 percent of the shares of the World Bank, and they have six, uh, same with the IMF, uh, similar order. So those would be easy measures to take. Yes, it would cost some pain in capitals in Europe because they're going to lose out on seats in the board. But frankly, uh, it, it would really be uh, a just and, and right move uh, towards China that would give them a, a bigger voice. Mind you, in the UN, uh, which China sees as the, as, the, as the mainstay of the international system, uh, uh, they have a very strong voice and they have a very strong sway. So I'm not that concerned about, about uh, China not being heard on the international forum. But it also means that, indeed, the obligations of China as in living by the UN Charter that they see as international law uh, is, is very important and also that they can convince other countries to do so as well. Marcella, I wonder what your take is on that. Well, uh, as, as David, I am not very optimistic really and also because we have to face the reality of the elections in November so things could also escalate from that. But going back to the phrase that you mentioned from Blinken, that some countries are on the table and some are on the menu, just to realize where this expression was said, it was the Munich Security Council. So for the rest of the world, for us that are on the menu, we know it. We know it and we know what comes with it, the conditionality that comes with it. So it's not only about the US and China, it's also for all the rest of us, what is the, basically the Putin's dilemma. So uh, as, as the future approaching now, especially in November, maybe we will have some uh, sort of shift, but it's not going to be maximum. Marcella Musa Bellew. Bert Hoffman and David Mahon, thank you all very much indeed. That brings us to the end of this special programme, China's Agenda, outlining the key messages from this year's two sessions, from new quality productive forces driving economic growth to the very real opportunities for the rest of the world to engage with China to ensure a peaceful and prosperous future. For more on all of our stories, go to europe.cgtn.com and do follow CGTN Europe on X, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok and YouTube. But for now, from me, Juliet Mann, and from all the team here in London, goodbye.